am Professor Emeritus at the University of Arizona. Emeritus simply means retired with honors. So being retired with honors means I, ha I can do everything I was doing before on campus except get paid. So I still have library privileges. I still could teach courses where I on campus. I could teach courses remotely. I can do everything except get paid. I taught and conducted research for more than 20 years at Texas A&M University, the University of Arizona, the University of California, Berkeley, Southern Utah University, and Grinnell College. Those are in chronological order. And I also squeezed in a year with the Nature Conservancy. I was the inaugural director of the Smith Fellows Program, a post postdoctoral program that is the most competitive in the world. And it is now administered by the Society for Conservation Biology. I have become a public speaker since I've become primarily a public speaker since leaving active service at the university. I was doing public speaking even before I left active service, of course, but that's been the primary motivation underlying my life recently is public speaking and trying to get the message out about the mass extinction event that is underway the likely consequences for our species and for many other species on the planet. So that gives the overall idea of what I'm doing now and what I've done in the past that contributes to what I'm doing now. I, I think it's important to point out that I'm a conservation biologist and conservation biologists are the academics, the scholars who study mass extinction events and who study the rate of change. And most people, even scientists, are unfamiliar with the concept underlying the idea of extinction, which very frequently points to a rate of environmental change that is too rapid for a species to keep up with. So even the best known climate scientists out there, almost all of them are physicists or astronomers and they have very a few or even engineers. Most of them have no understanding of biology or ecology, the importance of the rate of environmental change and how that affects the ability of species to survive. So that's very, that's a very fundamental part of how I reached the conclusions that I've reached over the course of the last several years. Within the last two weeks, I've moved with my partner to Poultney, Vermont in the United States. We had moved various places. We originally were together in Belize in Central America for about two and a half years and then moved to New York about an hour north of the city because her youngest sister was diagnosed with multiple myeloma. So we moved to be closer to her. And then we moved to central Florida where my partner has a brother and a sister. And it was obvious that their father had been experiencing some mental issues. So we moved to central Florida to drag my par par my partner's father down there and get him diagnosed. And sure enough, he has Alzheimer's. And so he's able to pursue care in that part of the world and live off and on with one of his other daughters and his son. So having completed that task just recently, we have moved to Vermont where the mountains greet us as well as some dear friends. So basically we moved to this part of the world for self-care, having spent the last many years focusing on the care of our family members. You know, we felt a certain responsibility mm -hmm. to um, caring for the other people in our life. Pauline is the oldest of four. She has three younger siblings and their mother died more than 25 years ago. So my partner Pauline has 
for a long time taken on the responsibility that the oldest female sometimes has. She has become the maternal figure, in other words. So we're, we've been doing things from the family perspective for quite a long time that are of substantial benefit to her family. And you don't often see much of that kind of expression, any expression of emotions, in fact, from scientists, from people who are claiming to be scientists, for those people to write or speak about love or any emotions for, for that matter. Those are the kind of things that scientists typically avoid because we work so hard to seek objectivity to try to be objective in our work, to remove our personal feelings from our conclusions. And interestingly, I wrote a, an essay at my blog, johnmcpherson.com, on October 4th, 2014, so just about seven years ago now, called Only Love Remains. And I point out that I've tried to turn my back on my emotions for a long time because I'm a rationalist, which means a scientist. My entire career was spent as a scientist and a teacher. My laser-like focus on reason and rational thinking precluded the expression of feelings. And that was a, an attitude from my scientific life that was reinforced by the culture in which I came of age, a culture in which the only thing worse than having feelings was expressing those feelings. That's just something we didn't do in my family or in the culture generally. For most of my life, I've been mystified by public displays of affection and by people who mourned the loss of individual lives. And that sounds crazy because I'm a human being, but that's what become a, becoming a scientist means in this academic culture is to try to set aside those feelings in the pursuit of objectivity. So I keep, I, I, I kept and I keep thinking I'd work my way through the, the five Kubler-Ross stages of grief. And then when my rational side starts to take over, I'm overwhelmed again by what's going on in the world. And I end up mourning for the species we're driving to extinction. In fact, in 2002, as I was editing a book on climate change, I realized we had triggered events likely to cause human extinction by 2030. Burning fossil fuels that accumulated over millions of years within the span of a couple of centuries is having expectedly horrific impacts on the environment we, we share with millions of other species. Recognizing the horrors that we triggered, the, the terrible outcomes of our collective actions for those many years, I mourned for months to the bewilderment of the three people who noticed. Because we tend to be fairly self-motivated, maybe even self-absorbed in this culture. And so if somebody else is experiencing emotional hardship or emotional pain, most of us just look the other way because we have been informed by this culture our entire lives that we just don't express feelings like that. And that if you're expressing feelings like that, there must be something wrong with you. So, uh, you know, I recognize now that that's a terrible way to think. But until I was in my 40s, I thought that was normal. That was the culture I was raised in. And so now we're coming up on 12 years since I abandoned the luxury-filled, high-pay, low-work position I loved as a tenured full professor. Originally, to go back to the land to grow my own food, to make my own cheese. I became a master cheese maker and raised small livestock, including goats, from which I got the milk to make the cheese and growing a lot of food and planting trees, fruit and nut trees and so on. And 
so I tried to lead by example in breaking away from the monetary bonds of this culture and in becoming a leader, almost nobody followed. And so another source of heartbreak for me was that I led and vanishingly few followed. The, the new path was quite a challenge for a lifelong academic who could barely distinguish between a screwdriver and a zucchini. You know, I didn't have the skills and I went back to the land and I had to learn rough carpentry and plumbing and masonry and gardening and animal husbandry. And so I was hurt about half the time. I was constantly breaking my ribs or breaking fingers or putting myself through all kinds of terrible pain because I was unskilled at the work, at the new work I was trying to do. So it was, it was emotionally and physically painful to go through the whole thing. But I spent several years in the wilds of New Mexico living within a couple of miles of the first designated wilderness area in the world, and still the largest designated wilderness area in the lower 48 United States. The only larger ones are in Alaska. And so I was very close to the land, and my love for the natural world returned to the place that it had been when I was a kid growing up. I grew up in a small village of 700 people and spent, it was a different time then. You know, this was the 1960s and early 1970s and I played outdoors all the time and I didn't have to be home at a certain hour. I just had to be home by dark. And I, you know, it's such a different world today. Kids are on leashes, literally on leashes, and attached to their parents all the time. And they can't go play. They can't. I was a free-range child. Yes. Pretty much my entire upbringing, I was out playing in the woods and playing in the rivers and the streams adjacent to the woods. And I grew up in a family that did a lot of hunting and fishing. And so... Even the time, even after I was old enough to not be, quote, playing in the woods anymore, I was still playing in the woods just with a rifle or a fishing rod in my hand. So I grew up in the wilds of northern Idaho in the most beautiful of settings and was allowed and even encouraged to spend much of my time out there in the natural world. And so I did. And I fell in love. Not the kind of love that most people think of, not the romantic love of a relationship, but the love of the natural world. In fact, I looked up before we started here, I looked up the definition of love from the Merriam-Webster online dictionary. And the first definition is quote, strong affection for another arising out of kinship or personal ties. And the example provided is maternal love for a child. And I would argue that human beings can feel that sort of love for the natural world or for various elements in the natural world. Most young people in particular, when they see a panda bear or some other mammal with eyes that face forward, they're immediately attracted to it. They feel this strong sense of community, of affection, of love. The second definition from the Merriam-Webster online dictionary is warm attachment, enthusiasm, or devotion. And the example given is love of the sea. So I, I think both of those definitions fit very well. I loved the natural world in ways that I suspect most kids today are not allowed to because they they don't even spend any time in the natural world. They're, they're tethered to their parents all the time. They can't even get out there and play in the creeks and the woods and the fields and, and know that there are other organisms besides human beings. The, the call of the birds, the sight of the mammals, the kinds of things that I saw as a kid that I recognize today in interacting with other adults my age and younger, other people never see. 
So some people have never seen an an organism half their size or larger, except for in a zoo. So most people in the United States at this point have never seen a bear. I think that's amazing because they're everywhere. The, the bears in, in North America are quite common. And the elk and the deer and the mountain lions, you know, these are all, quote, wild animals, all of which I saw and interacted with and in far too many cases shot at, usually missed, occasionally hit. And I'm not sure that was any better when I was growing up, because that was just part of the part of what the culture was doing. We, we provided all the meat that I ate as a kid. We provided it by shooting it or catching it on a hook. And those are not the kinds of things that very many people get to do anymore. And I think that's tragic, personally. And it influenced my entire life and made me realize later when I moved to that off-grid homestead, when I moved to that place that I created that was embedded within the natural world, those earlier experiences came back to me and made me realize the love I felt for the natural world made me remember that after having spent 40 years trying to divorce myself from those feelings because that's what this culture encourages us to do. You know, it's... It's amazing that we get to be here at all. The, the privilege to be here on this life-giving planet at this astonishing time in human history is sufficient to inspire awe in the most uncaring of individuals. We, at, the, at this late juncture in the age of industry, at the dawn of our, of our new day, short though it may be on earth, we still have love for each other love for our children, love for our grandchildren, love for nature, which for me is as important as those other relationships. In other words, through all the horrors of the human experience, particularly the quote, civilized human experience, based upon logic and experience, love is what we have left. Love remains, despite all that we have done collectively and individually as a species. And to, to be able to recognize that, I think, is important. My partner and I created a workshop. First, we went to the Grief Recovery Workshop created by the Grief Recovery Institute. That was in January of 2014. And I went because I knew that the, the topics I was speaking about in my public presentations induced despair in some people. And so I thought I could go to this workshop and I would learn how to deal with the despair of others in my public persona. And what I found is that I was experiencing grief that I didn't know I had. What I discovered was a definition of grief that finally for me made sense because grief is one of the topics that we're really not allowed to talk about in this culture. We don't talk about death, dying, grief, grieving, bodily functions. There's a whole bunch of things that we do every single day that the culture says, no, we don't talk about that. You know, big boys don't cry. Don't bring your grief in, into the public arena, that sort of thing. And what I learned was what has become my favorite definition of grief from the Grief Recovery Institute, wishing for a different past. This made a lot of sense to me, wishing for a different past. What it really means is we have this attachment. We have this attachment to the people we loved, say, our parents and our siblings when we were growing up. And the relationship changes over time. And in my case, that has been very obvious. The relationship between me and my siblings and my parents has changed over time. And so for a long time, I was stuck in that wishing for a different past. I thought we could somehow return 
to the love we felt when I was 15 years old, when I was 10 years old. But no, they have moved on. Other people move on with their lives. There's significant departures that occur in our lives, whether we're leaving other people through divorce or death, separation of one kind or another, or because we move across the country. We separate from places. We separate from people. There's all kinds of drivers for that. And if we keep trying to hold on to that same relationship we once had, that that invokes grief. That makes us sad because it's not like it used to be. So the most important thing I learned from the Grief Recovery Institute was I need to get over it. It's time for me to move on. And the Grief Recovery Workshop presented some relatively simple, straightforward exercises that allowed us, the participants, to move on, to get on with their lives, to, to work through the relationships that, that had been dear to us for a long time, and then change the nature of that relationship, not terminate the relationship, right? So I would never terminate my relationship with, with my parents, for example or my siblings, but I changed the nature of the relationships so that I'm not wishing for that different past anymore because they changed their perspective on our relationship. And it's not the same as it once was. So it's time for me to move on as well. So we're a lot closer to acquaintances and drinking buddies, although I don't drink, neither do they for the most part, than we are to being, mm, very intimately connected friends as we once were. Aristotle's definition of friendship comes into play here. Aristotle defined friendship as a relationship between people working together for the common good. Now think about that for a minute. That's amazing. Now we think of friendship as the interactions we have with the people we drink beer with people we go to the bar with, people we go to the game with, people we watch television with, people we go to the movies with, and so on. It has very little to do with working, much less working together. And it has little to do with a project for the common good. So now I, I, I tend to focus on those relationships that have the common good in mind and that contribute to the common good in some way through the work that we do. Sorry for that digression. Returning to an idea you just brought up, Buddhism. Mm -hmm. One of the best things we can do is express our gratitude on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, on a minute by minute basis. Because think about how privileged we are to be here at all. Our knowledge of DNA informs us that the odds against any one of us being here are greater than the odds against being a particular grain of sand on all the world's beaches. In fact, the odds are much greater than that. Much greater. They exceed the odds of being a single atom plucked at random from the entire universe. That's what we know about DNA and its contribution to making us who we are. As evolutionary biologist and science educator Richard Dawkins says, Quote, in the teeth of these stupefying odds, it is you and I that are privileged to be here, privileged with eyes to see where we are and brains to wonder why, end quote. And so for me, at least, expressing gratitude for each day that I'm alive on Earth it has become very important to me. And, you know, there's some terrible things that have happened in my life to me and around me and to people who are my friends and so on. But acknowledging our privilege to be here at all, to have the ability to carry on this conversation thousands of miles apart from each other, to have this conversation about love and ecology and the environment and the great unraveling as it, as it goes on is absolutely incredible. The astonishing rate of change occurring right now in in the environment that surrounds us on planet Earth is the fastest in human history by far. And yet we're still here. There's a, there's a paper in 
the journal Annual Review of Earth and Planetary Sciences. And the annual reviews are among the most conservative of a very conservative process, that of peer review. And this paper, which is called The Future of Arctic Sea Ice, written by Wieslav Maslowski and others, pointed out a projection of an ice-free Arctic in 2016 plus or minus three years. And we know that based on the rate of environmental change after an ice-free Arctic occurs, the heating of the planet will be so rapid that it is unlikely our species or very many others on Earth will survive. Just because of the exceedingly rapid rate of change. And um, among the examples are albedo. Albedo is white has very high albedo or reflectance. And right now we have ice in the Arctic Ocean. Imagine when all that ice gives way to a different color, gives way to the deep blue of the ocean. Now a whole bunch of light that is reflected will not be reflected. And so we now know that once we have an ice-free Arctic, it will not be long because of the rate of environmental change will be so rapid. It won't be long that we will have humans or very many other organisms on the planet. And so we dodged that bullet 2016 plus, more, plus or minus three years. And here we are 2021 and we still haven't had that ice-free Arctic projected in that paper. This is fantastic. It reminds me every day that another day upright is something to be grateful for. I think there are a couple of things. From a scientific perspective. So let's look at it from a societal scientific perspective. And then if I can remember to look at it from a private personal mm. perspective as well. From the, the large view, there is little that can be done. We know that the current level of industrial activity, which is very high, if we maintain that, it will continue to overheat the planet. We currently occupy the warmest planet with humans on it. So we're already on dangerous ground here because if we warm the planet further, we will continue to lose habitat. In fact, we're already losing habitat for human animals on Earth. There's a paper published June 19th, 2015, that was the first recognition that we're in the mass, midst of a mass extinction event by the peer-reviewed literature. And then more recently, there's a paper that came out on May 8th, 2020, so not quite a year ago, in Science Advances called The Emergence of Heat and Humidity Too Severe for Human Tolerance by Colin Raymond and colleagues. And it indicates surprise that we are already losing habitat for human animals because of high heat and humidity in tropical and subtropical areas. These are the kinds of things that were not expected to occur for several more decades, and yet they're already happening. I saw it myself when we were living in Central America. We would be working outdoors with carpenters, people building structures and people would start to exhibit act behaviors associated with organ failure they would suddenly be ex expressing poor judgment about something they'd been doing for their entire lives there'd be carpenters that's, that certain that suddenly couldn't hit the nail with the hammer anymore there'd be people who were stumbling as they walked these are the early signs of organ failure. So we would have to take those people aside, stick them in the swimming pool, give them plenty of water, have them sit in the shade and so on. It's already happening. We're already losing habitat for humans around the globe because of high temperatures and high relative humidity. Given that it's already happening, given that increasing high levels of industrial activity lead to loss of habitat for human animals. What to do? Well, we could reduce industrial activity, but as it turns out, reducing industrial activity due to loss of aerosol masking or 
loss of global dimming, that will accelerate the temperature rise even faster. And because of the rate of change is so important, increasing the rate of change at this point would be catastrophic for our species. So from the large scale societal perspective, we're really in a catch 22, a damned if you do and damned if you don't situation. We can either maintain industrial activity, which is driving the ongoing mass extinction event and causing many, many species to go extinct and causing loss of habitat for our own species. Or we can reduce that industrial activity and that will cause everything to accelerate even more. So when, when I hear that we need to do something, I agree, at least at the level of individuals, but I don't know what there is to be done at the level of society. And I think the people in governments the CEOs of large corporations and so on. I think they know what I know, that if we reduce industrial activity significantly, that we will lose those aerosols and that will cause loss of habitat for humans. So, so we just keep going because that's what we know how to do. <laughs> that's what we do after all. That's, that's all I ever heard growing up. That's all you ever heard growing up was the mentality, must go faster. That's, that's the defining motto for our time, must go faster. Insane though it is. So I kind of understand at the societal level why we are as, as a species or as a society are not doing anything. At the level of private personal lives, at the level of how we live every day, we really, we're born into a trap. You and I were born into a society in which people went to school and they went to school some more and then they fell in love and they got married and they had 2.5 children and they worked until they were 65 or whatever and then they retired and then they started drawing a retirement check and this is just what everybody did. This is what my parents did. And they were pleased to be doing it because life was so much better than it was for their parents. And that's what my generation did. And they were pleased to be doing it because we had smartphones. We had, our lives seemed so much better than our parents' lives. And so there's this mentality that we were born into that I call, based on a quote from my friend Tim Bennett, born into captivity. We were born into this set of living relationships. And it's very, very difficult to do anything else, at least anything substantive. When I broke away from the monetary, I recognized that the monetary system was driving us to extinction. So I left active service at the University of Arizona at the age of 49. That drew so much hate, it was unbelievable. I was trying to demonstrate that there is another way to live. And immediately, I was persona non grata. I was the person that nobody would talk to because I did the crazy thing. And so at the level of individuals pursuing our personal lives, it's very difficult to break out of this born into captivity set of living arrangements that surrounds us. And if you try to do that, people are just going to look at you like you're out of your mind. Even making relatively small changes, people think that's a little bizarre. You know, try, in the United States, where we have a two-party system of governance, a, a third party, somebody running as an independent or libertarian or whatever, they don't stand a chance. Because in this country, you get two choices, and they're basically the same choice. I refer to them as the twin cheeks of the corporate ass. It's the same, it's just, it's the same butt. <laughs> it's just different cheeks. It's ridiculous. But nobody I've ever interacted with thinks we should do anything differently. Almost nobody thinks, yeah, you just need to vote Democratic. You need to vote Republican. That'll fix it. No, that doesn't fix anything. We've been doing that for a while. Anyway, sorry, yeah. I get all excited. <laughs> well, because I grew up in a village and spent a lot of my time 
in the adjacent forests and fields and splashing around in the creeks and rivers. I suspect I have a stronger emotional attachment to the natural world than most people do. I have interacted personally, individually with organisms that many people have never seen. And so maybe that gives me a stronger connection to the natural world than other people have. And maybe that's what drives a lot of the decisions I made, many of which were errors, obviously, in retrospect. So, you know, we're, <laughs> we're all different, obviously. And so there's this, undoubtedly, this, this spectrum, this gradient from somebody who maybe still is in an undiscovered tribe and has this deep understanding and appreciation for the natural world. And then at the other spectrum, we have psychopaths who couldn't care less about anything except their own privilege and certainly don't love the natural world or even the people around them. They, they view the people around them as resources to be exploited rather than relationships to provide love. Uh, I'm reminded of a quote from American existential psychologist Rollo May, quote, the opposite of courage in our society is not cowardice, it is conformity. And this has become a society of conformity. If you don't do what everybody else is doing, then you're doing it wrong. And I don't know how we got to that point. It wasn't that long ago in history that people were encouraged to ask questions, even difficult questions. It wasn't that long ago in history that people could break away from the culture in which they were embedded and live differently and not be disparaged for it. And today it seems like we're well beyond that. Today it seems like you live this one way or you're not one of us. You're the with the, with what, what is the George W. Bush expression? You're either with us or you're with the terrorists. You know, this, this black and white us yeah. and them thinking that seems to dominate every aspect of our lives now. I was doing a reading from my 2006 book, the name of which escapes me right now. Mm, but it's about teaching. And the final paragraph of the book, I read the final paragraph of the book during this reading and it says something about the most revered name that you could call somebody was a teacher because learning from somebody is valuable and rare. Most of us learn through our own self-teaching. We, we learn as we go along. We learn from experience and so on. Relatively few people learn from somebody they call a teacher. So I think to be, a call, to be called a teacher is among the highest compliments one can get. And after I gave the presentation, somebody I barely knew, probably 20 years older than me, came up to me and said, thank you, teacher. And so it had a real impact, what I was saying on him. And that was nice. Another example, I've been in presentation halls speaking to millennials, people a, a generation or so younger than me. And this is really terrible news that I'm presenting. I'm talking about the extinction of our species and many others. And so it's not the kind of thing that I'm happy to be talking about. And surely the students hearing it are not happy to hear it either. And yet I have finished and then I'll be speaking one-on-one -on -one or what, me with a small group of people afterwards. And I'll catch out of the corner of my eye, students in their 20s and 30s skipping 
through the lecture hall as if they're eight years old again. Because somebody finally told them the truth. They've known it almost their entire lives. They know that something is seriously awry, that something is wrong. Something terrible is happening. They can see it every day. They read about it. They see it on the news. And yet nobody will talk about it. Everybody glosses it over. Everybody tells them, you have to fix this. We broke it. You fix it. That's horrible. I'm telling them it's broken. There is no fixing it, except in your personal life, there are actions you can take. Rooted in love. Do that. Don't fall for the trick that you have to reduce carbon dioxide emissions so that some rich person can burn the gasoline that you are not burning. I encourage people to, live, to pursue excellence in their lives, to pursue love, and to not be concerned about things like their carbon footprint. If you're 30 years old, you don't have the opportunity to have a carbon footprint, the likes of which a millionaire has, the likes of which people a generation older than you have. So if you can find some way to pursue excellence in your life and to, to do what you love, then who am I to tell you to not do that? I think that's the most important thing we can do. We know that our lives are short. Even if you live to be 100, your life is short. At the time, I was doing a speaking tour in Western Europe about six years ago. And there was a woman who, at the time, was the oldest human being on Earth. She was 117 years old. And when she was asked to ponder those first 117 years of her life at her birthday party she said it seemed rather short 117 years it seemed rather short and i promise that your life will seem short too no matter how long it is and then to put a punctuation point on her short response to that question she died a few weeks later so she died at the age of 117 in a few weeks, and it seemed rather short. And I'm not going to make it that long. I can't even imagine wanting to make it that long. I have so many aches and pains when I get up already that if I live twice as long as I am now, I can't even imagine how much pain I would be in. <laughs> and I know that it will seem rather short, that every day seems so short now, that every month just slips by, slips by so quickly. The, the kinds of things that when I was a kid playing in VIP Idaho when I was 10 years old, the days would go on forever. It seemed like the day would never end. And now it seems like the day doesn't even start and it's over. And a third example, yeah. in addition to being told I was a teacher and to seeing those millennials skip across the lecture hall, along with my partner, I developed a workshop called Only Love Remains. And we, we have as a requirement before you take the workshop that you have to agree that we are in the midst of abrupt climate change that is going to shorten the lives of almost everybody on Earth. You have to agree to that. Now, let's talk about it. Now, let's talk about our feelings. Now, let's talk about what that means. Now, let's go through some exercises and reflect on my own personal life and how I'm going to act from here forward. That has been enormously successful for the people who have completed the workshop in the way they think and the way they act. And so those are three relatively minor examples of ways that I have dealt with grief and grieving mm -hmm. and love and incorporated love into the notion of ecological slash environmental disintegration. Sure. And uh, my partner and I have elaborated extensively at onlyloveremains.org. 
so you can look at the website and see what our thinking is at least and we also have responses from people who have completed the workshop to have their impressions of the value of thinking about how we're going to spend our days you, you know it was some 2800 years ago that homer wrote in the iliad any moment might be our last any moment might be our last. And so that's what we encourage people to do with this workshop. And what I've been trying to encourage people to do since I first posted uh, an, an essay on the topic of abrupt climate change on June 20th, 2012, I've been trying to get people to live with urgency. Your life is going to be short by virtually any metric, it will be short. We don't have long as individuals or as a species here on planet Earth. And if that isn't sufficient motivation for you to live with urgency, to live with love, to pursue excellence, then I don't know what is going to do it for you. This is all we have. This is, as far as we can tell, this is all we have. It's a relatively short time on this most beautiful of planets. We were lucky to be here at all at so many levels. For life to persist more than a billion years, and it's been considerably more than a billion years, on a planet is incredibly rare. That's what the recent evidence says from planetary sciences. For, for our DNA to come together in this form so that we, something we call me, something I call you, for Ghidra and Guy and Pauline and, and John and Bob and William, for all these people to appear as unique, separate individuals and have this experience on the most incredible planets, that's essentially impossible. The odds against that happening are surreal. And yet here we are, waking up every day, looking out outdoors, seeing the trees, hearing the birds, having the opportunity to breathe the air. And you're complaining about your life? Give me a break. <laughs> yes. And I've to I'm told every day that it's completely inappropriate approach. That for me to remind people that their lives are short, for me to remind people that they are actually going to die, makes me among the most terrible people on earth. I hear this every day from paid climate scientists, from politicians, from heads of corporations. And yet, on the other hand, I am asked nearly every day for advice about living. My response to that is, I recommend living where you feel most alive and simultaneously where you feel most useful. And, and this is, as, as we conversed earlier, this has been the defining element for my life for these last many years. I need to be useful. And yet, I also want to feel alive. And that's a difficult balance to strike sometimes. Because we don't want to abandon the world. We don't, don't want to abandon the people in our world. And yet, we need to be alive. We can't fall into the trap that has us suffering from compassion fatigue after we live someplace for six months. Anyway, I recommend living fully. I recommend living with intention. I recommend living urgently with death in mind. I recommend the pursuit of excellence. I recommend the pursuit of love. In light of the short time remaining in your life and in my own, I recommend all of the above, louder than before, more fully than you can imagine to the limits of this restrictive culture and beyond. For you, for me, for us, for here, for now. It's time to live large. Be you as only you can be, as we've talked about before, given the nature of DNA. Be bolder than you've ever been. Live as though you're dying. The day draws near. How could you not? Once you accept the notion that everybody dies and that it's not long it's not something that's far off in the future 
then at least for me and for the people whose lives I have touched, it's a positive message. It encourages people to smell the flowers. You know, I talked about Homer in the Iliad earlier. The gods in, in, in the Iliad, the gods envied mortal humans because the gods had to live forever. Forever is a long time, especially toward the end. So there was no motivation for the gods to go sniff the flowers. Why would you smell the roses? They're going to be there in another million years, in another billion years. There's no need to appreciate what you have here and now. The gods envy mortal humans because they're mortal. Because we get to have these experiences. We get to have this conversation. We get to drink the water. We get to smell the flowers. We get to take a walk in the beautiful park. The gods could do all that, but why bother? They're going to live forever. There's always another bowl of ice cream to be had. There's no need to appreciate, to relish the taste of that ice cream today. You have tomorrow. Well, I'm here to tell you, you might not have tomorrow. And you certainly don't have a lot of tomorrows. Uh, her earlier book, the one that I appreciated even more, was one that few people have heard about. It's a biography of Eustace Conway IV called The Last American Man. And it's about this man who learned as a boy how to live in the wild on his own. So he learned how to tan hides and kill and eat squirrels and all these other things that previous generations had always done. And so she described him as the last American man because he was the man who was still doing all these things. He was still riding a horse. He, was, he could still use his knife and throw it at a squirrel and pin the squirrel to the tree with a knife from 10 feet away. You know, he had these skills that most of us don't have anymore. And in, in the end, she had not very kind things to say about the personality of this man because in his obsession with the way he lived, that obsession got in the way of feelings that he had, positive feelings that he had or might have had with other people. And so it turned out to be quite tragic that he was painted as a really horrible person when it, when the book, the first two thirds of the book, you think this is some sort of superhero, like this, this is Batman, Superman all rolled into one. And then his personality begins to reveal itself and what he has given up personally in exchange for the ability to live in this certain way. It's really quite a tale that, in retrospect, is a lens through which to view my own life, trying to live differently than most other people. And having people conclude that in the process of my obsession with doing that, I became an asshole. I mean, an undesirable person, if you're going to edit this. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? Love is the thing. Love is the thing. It is the thing worth pursuing. It is the thing that defines our lives. I have a, I have a radio show that has gone for about 150 episodes so far. And on May 31st, 2015, I believe it was, I interviewed a guy named Jamie Hecht. Jamie Hecht has a PhD, a doctor of philosophy. He was a professor on the tenure track. And then for love, he moved from the Northeastern United States to Los Angeles to help Michael C. Rupert, who subsequently died and, and moved almost immediately after Jamie moved across the country to help further his work. And so Jamie stayed there in California and, and got another doctorate degree a doctorate of psychiatry 
And so he's the only person I know who has a doctoral degree in psychiatry and also in philosophy. Moved back to Brooklyn where he grew up recently, knowing all that I know about the aerosol masking effect and an abrupt irreversible climate change and where we're headed as a species. So when I talked to Jamie, that was many years ago on the air, that remains the most influential and informative conversation I've ever had on the air with somebody on my show. Because what he did was point out the importance of love. And we talked about it for almost the entire show. And and I've, I've met him in person and stayed in his home when I was on a speaking tour. And he lives it. He knows the importance of love. And he lives it. And he describes his past relationships, including a marriage or two along the way, as smoldering trash fires. That's the way they turned out. And yet, love is always worth it. Love is worth the price you pay. The price is great. Pursue it.